Ayushi they pronouns. I'm Mimia, I use she her pronouns. And we are the directors of Our Monologues! <laughs> um, first, we would like to acknowledge that we are on the territory of Huichen, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chochenyo speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. We also want to recognize that a land acknowledgement is not enough without material resources and action towards indigenous, cultural, political, and land sovereignty. Um, please check out our website and Instagram for more resources. Yes, um, and so for the folks who don't know what our monologues is, Four years ago, Mara Halpern and Daphne Alfariadu created an entirely student-run production featuring stories submitted by the Berkeley High community. So every year there's a new set of monologue songs and dances all performed by Berkeley High students. Yeah, so Judy and I joined that very first year of our monologues as freshmen in 2020. Um, <laughs> we had no idea what we were getting into, but we found not only a performance of powerful students and stories, but a wonderful and loving community. Mm -hmm. um, and four years later, Berkeley High looks a lot different. We hope that um, our show and our stories help to build empathy and solidarity and that like these stories make you feel heard. Yeah, so in tonight's show, we hope that there are pieces that, you know, echo your experiences and make you feel heard, but also pieces that challenge your thinking and might make you feel a little bit uncomfortable. Yes, and so some logistics. It is important to know that some cast members are performing pieces that they've written themselves and other cast members are performing pieces written by someone else. And please check your program for monologues marked with specific content warnings. Um, some of the monologues include topics on sexual harm, racial violence, and suicide. So please feel free to step out anytime during the show if you feel uncomfortable or need any space. Um, and there will also be a 10 minute intermission about one hour into the show where you can also buy posters that we're selling outside. Yep. Um, and so please make sure your phones are silenced. No flash photography. Um, we're trying to keep photography and filming to a minimum. Um, we're filming these shows and photos and videos will be posted in a couple weeks. And no food and drink in the theater, please. Yeah, so this show was made by and for all of you guys. So throughout the show, please feel free to snap along, cheer along um, when you are late or connect to something. So can we hear you guys snap if this is your first time seeing our monologues? Amazing. Welcome. <laughs> Now, Snap, if you have already seen an Armand's show. Yeah. I know some of y'all are returning from, I guess, like last week, yesterday. Um, okay, Snap, if you felt tired at some point this week. Yeah, same, same. I can agree with that. Um, and please, Snap and cheer if you are excited to see the show. all of you guys to sit back, snap along, cheer along, and please enjoy our
does love like that. I reach out a so-called olive branch, spreading like the entangled roots of our friendship. She glances, slowly reaches out to hold the branch, shy yet steady. As she grows more confident, she pulls me close, our fingers intertwined, whispering in my ear the secrets bubbling back. I'm pulling towards her while pushing away with all my might. I have to tell you something, we, we both say. She begins to paint a picture of flower fields and bumblebees, snow-capped mountains, and we end, she and I, beyond the passion fruit vine.
trouble remembering things. The things are little, like, like the name of the movie I watched last night. Damn it! What movie did I watch last night? Or that new piece of gossip. Who told me that new piece of gossip? Or like the other day in my Spanish class, my friend was giving me updates on our favorite hallway celebrity. She's a code names kind of person. So while I knew what real names corresponded to my hallway celebrity, I did not know what real names corresponded to the other code names. I <coughs> thought I was following along until my friend told me that our favorite hallway celebrity ended up making out with their sibling under the G1 staircase. And then I realized I was severely lost. My memory problem was a funny one, and I came to accept that the reason I was forgetting these minuscule things was that I was just so busy, I forgot to take in the details of my life. This predicament became a little less silly when I began to forget my feelings. I don't think all feelings need to be remembered. Not the sadness of scoring low in a test, not the elation of sipping a drink that just hits the spot. These feelings only define me for a moment. So there isn't much value in remembering them long term. But there are some feelings that define you indefinitely. Feelings that leave such an imprint on you that you should definitely remember them. Feeling trapped. Feeling the excruciating pain and praying to a God you don't actually believe in to make it stop. The feeling of disappointment in yourself for not asking for what you need, not being strong. The feeling of happiness after because he holds your hand and he is happy and gives you kisses. The feeling of not wanting to be kissed, coexisting with the feeling of specialness because he wants to kiss you. Feeling empty and cold when you go home and wanting to put tiny band-aids over your big wounds. Feelings like this are supposed to change you, right? You might cry, you might be in shock, you might deny that these feelings happened and then come to accept them later. I just forget them. For me, these feelings go away after they are felt. Forgetting feelings is infuriating because who am I without them? My feelings define me, and when I forget them, I forget myself. But every now and then, a little fragment of a feeling I once felt slips to the front of my mind. And I feel proud of myself just because I remembered it. And I'm becoming myself again. Feeling of being tricked, 
violated, hurt, boundaries crossed, was welling in my stomach like vile little eels, and there was nothing I could do besides sob and yell and hate that I let myself tumble into such an intense position of vulnerability. I didn't blame myself. I know better. I knew nothing was my fault, but I hated, despised that I had let happen, and that there was nothing to do. No way to change it, no way to shield myself from it. No way to clean my tainted clothes. No way to hide these purples and blues from myself. No way to remove it. No way to go besides sobbing right through. Nothing made me feel like I had control. Leather jacket hugs, plastic slides, the sharp cold night were comfort but not control. The lip gloss and mascara spilling from my pockets was a fucking desperate attempt at control, but it wasn't the power I needed. Everything was a cliff-grabbing grasp for a breath of control, and nothing came close. Everything felt so utterly, completely, head-slipping, glitter-falling, bottles shattering, grassy stumbling, stuck toes disgustingly powerless. Shoulders heaving, swollen eyes, blankets heavy, lamp posts leaning, powerless. Tiny and wasted, large and blundering, hot and drowning, cold and drifting, powerless. Iridescent snail slime on my limbs, in my hair, over my eyes, tying me back to right then. That starry sky, the winding wheels, the water, the still air, the walk home. No way slip quietly back into the night before, keep myself from diving into the same mistake. Nothing to do besides shake uncontrollably and hide behind people from what I can't change. It wasn't even when it happened that I felt powerless. It was the night after, knowing that it had happened knowing that there was nothing I could do, knowing that I hated it, despised it, and knowing that I never, ever want it to happen again. She, they, it's like, I am woman, and I am so much more. I am woman, because that's what you keep telling me. Keep telling me until I believe it. Keep telling me until it's true. But what does it mean to be woman if it was you who invented her? I would rather live in an identity of my own making where I can build my own nest and I'm not limited to the materials you offer. She, they is freedom. She, they is if you don't understand it, can I please introduce you to my good friend Google? I don't know if you realize, but this drunken game of rage cage is not the place to question my identity. Neither was that time around the campfire. Believe it or not, my idea of a good time is not actually defending my pronouns in front of five strangers. She, they, is keep your fucking hands off my body. Yes, you, with your beady eyes who didn't hear her say no. Yes, you, with your locker room jokes you thought we'd never hear. And yes, you, 
with your shining, empty job title and half-ass investigation whose only finding is insufficient evidence. It is reclaiming, telling you that I am not yours and I am not who you think I am or who you say I must be. I break, I defy, I destroy, and I live. I live and I live and I live. You created this box called woman, yet you did not create me. So how can I be woman? She, they. Suddenly putting my pronouns at the end of my emails feels aggressive. She, her was woke. She, they is asking too much of you. I am asking you to do something you wouldn't otherwise do. Am I supposed to care? Woman is supposed to care. Do I care? I don't think I care. And yet, she, they is selectively sharing my pronouns only when I'm sure it won't change how you view me, you being all of you. She, they might make me an other. It is a powerful force and that it shatters fragile mountains and carves deep chasms between me and you. I've thought about adding he, him. I don't mind the sound of all pronouns. I am all after all. And yet, I've yet to discover what's to be desired about masculinity. As in, it could be said that it's time to redefine masculinity on our own terms, and I agree, but he, him is not masculinity. He, him is man. And I want nothing to do with you, man. <laughs> he, him is inextricably linked to the violence and trauma it feels like I hold because of you, man. She, they is a comfy bean bag that finally conforms to the shape of me. It is finding just the right shape to hold me. And isn't that how it should be? Just so you know, she, they is here for you whenever you're ready. You don't have to earn it. If it feels right, then it's already yours. It was 8 a.m. I woke up drenched in sweat on the side of a cliff entering our 16 of my 21 hour solo camp out. I smelled blood. I had this irrational fear that I was gonna be attacked by raccoons. So naturally in this moment, I decided that I had fully been attacked. I scoured my body for any bites or scratches. And then I saw three huge splotches of blood on my sleeping bag. I shot up and there was a gush out of my vagina. <laughs> Without thinking, I slapped my hand down there and when I pulled it back up, it was covered in blood. I had literally bled through my underwear, my shorts, my sleeping bag, and and I smeared blood all over my sleeping pad. I stripped butt naked on the side of that cliff and used the rest of my water to clean myself off. I just spent the last half hour staring at my vagina through a hand mirror. Sorry, my vulva. Actually, I can't find the opening to my vagina. I, uh, I have no idea where it actually is. <laughs> Dear WebMD, is there a possibility that I have labial fusion, vaginal prolapse? What are the symptoms of not having a uterus? Why haven't I gotten my period yet? Do you have it? Do you? All my friends have had their periods for years, and I know most people with a period would 
praise me when I say I haven't gotten mine because I haven't experienced the absolute hell it can be, but I don't know, I'm curious. I want to be able to relate. Puberty and my period hit early. During recess, I'd usually sneak away with a pad hidden deep in my jacket pocket. I remember sitting on the small toilet seat trying to unwrap it as quietly as possible. My boobs were also fully present going into middle school, which everyone admired. I hated it. I didn't have time to say goodbye to the body I was comfortable in. All of a sudden, I was in this unfamiliar body with no confidence to ground myself in it. I was watching a political documentary about Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez today. And for some reason, I felt myself fighting a sob by the end of it. I could feel the need to cry, pushing its way up my throat, but I was not about to let myself cry in front of everyone in class. So I just sat there, confused as to why AOC evoked such a visceral emotional response within me. <laughs> to be honest, I've been on the brink of tears the whole week. Whether I'm happy, sad, irritated, or literally just existing, I'm on the brink of tears. Surprisingly, I haven't broken down and, well, cried, but now that I say that everything feels so much more intense, and now I'm thinking about AOC, and AOC, why are you doing this to me? I literally can't stand anyone right now. <laughs> Everything is getting on my nerves and I'm so irritated and, ugh. Are you okay? Please shut the fuck up. It is taking everything in me not to scream in everyone's faces and start throwing hands. I can't help snapping at everyone because I feel like I'm at my wit's end with existence. On top of being inexplicably angry, I am having the most gut-wrenching cramps of my life. My uterus can eat a fat shit for all I care. But, but your period is beautiful. It's unique to you. It makes you a cyclical being. You ebb and flow like waves in a tide. Well, actually, your period is the act of your uterus shedding its lining due to an egg not being fertilized. Wow, so my body is punishing me because I didn't have a child this month. Well, if you want to think about it that way, yeah. A period also includes premenstrual symptoms, also known as PMS. Common symptoms include headache, nausea, mood swings, cramps, and changes in hunger patterns and sleep patterns. Fun fact. I've been on my period for 80 days now. <laughs> 80. <laughs> Why? I don't know, but my doctors say it's all good, so I guess it's all good, right? <laughs> I don't know if that's normal, but let me tell y'all about this one time I was in the Kane Library bathroom with my friend changing a tampon. Okay, so I'm sitting down on the toilet, <laughs> I pull out my tampon, and I hear a plop. I look down, and in my right hand, I'm holding the tampon I've already removed, and I see another tampon in the <laughs> In retrospect, putting in that second tampon, like, hurt. <laughs> I grab the empty Tupperware container from my bag, and back at the toilet, I am desperately scooping, trying to get a clean grab on the tampon without too much toilet water, and at some point I just scoop and toss it away. Me and my friend clean up the blood splatters on the bathroom wall and floor, and then we book it out of the library. Speaking of blood splatters, I was trying to put my diva cup in before I had an appointment to get my septum pierced. I had it rolled up as tight as it could get, but I could not get that thing in there. <laughs> my aunt called for me. So I quickly untangled myself, and the diva cup just popped open and splattered blood all over me. I was wearing a white jacket. I didn't have time to change before my appointment, so I fully went to my appointment with 
blood splattered all over my white jacket. <laughs> Random thought of pregnancy? What the fuck? Right? If we don't want to worry about that, we have to go through invasive ass procedures. IUDs, Nexplanon, depo shots, pills, tube tying? That's why we're afraid of dick. <laughs> no one else can say they have to consistently exist with silicone cups and cotton tubes up their bodies. Or free bleed and not give an absolute fuck because we need to let our bodies get rid of at least a month's worth of built up tissue that doesn't need to be there. It is a visceral manifestation of the amount of shit we have to go through. Anything, Anything you, you can, can do, do, I can do bleeding. <laughs> Or with a waist that small. But that's besides the point. 
I tried to appreciate them. When Kim Petras came out with her song Coconuts, I tried to connect with the lyrics. When she said, look at these margarita tots, I tried to look at my margarita tots in the mirror, but I had no urge to name them Cartier or Tiffany, nor believe that all good things come in twos. I thought too much about what it would be like without them. If I were as bendy as heated plastic, I'd unscrew them so that every morning the jarring discomfort would be no more. I would put them on my shelf, sit them there ever so politely next to their watch. I'd go downstairs and back up again just because I could without the weight on my chest literally tugging on me. I'd give them a plaque, thanking them for their service, and send them off with a patriotic salute. <laughs> Eventually, I'd have them buried in a national park in their own little casket with a pretty pink bow in hopes that in years to come, when I'm dead and gone, they'll be unearthed and displayed in an art museum <laughs> for others to appreciate. If it were possible, I would have gotten a refund. But I guess these things just don't come with receipts, much less return policies. So I've waited and waited, hoping they'll turn into one big foster failure because all I want for Christmas is some closure. So please, take my boobs. <laughs> they were not on my Christmas list. <laughs> Anything. 
of melon clean as I cried for my mother. Captured my wrists to the ground, turned my chest into beaten fruit. This home is empty now. No fumes, no power, no functioning water. The food is wasted. From head to foot, I am layered in filth. Fruit flies, cobwebs, defects. Can someone call the plumber? My stomach's backed up. I've been vomiting since. Can someone call the electrician? My eyes won't light up. Can someone call the cleaners? Wash me up and hang me to dry. When you broke into my home, it never felt like mine again. I couldn't let another lover in without getting sick. I lose sleep after the first date. Lose my appetite. Became more bone and less skin. I'd forget to breathe. Every night my bedroom displayed a sight board of panic attacks. Every person who touched me presented like you. Their fingers you, their mouths you, until they're not the ones on top of me anymore. It's you. And I am so tired of doing things your way. It isn't working. I've spent years trying to figure out how I could have stopped it, but your pleasure can't stop my discomfort from coming. The tree can't stop the axe. I can't blame myself for having a space the size of your manhood in my chest anymore. It is too heavy to carry your guilt. I am setting it down. I am tired of decorating this place with your shame as if it pertains to me. It is too heavy to walk around with what your hands have done. Enjoy this tip. 
difficult Tuesday afternoon. This belongs to me.
Heavy, the one I hold in my hands, who cradles so many names until they drip down to dirt. And so I try to dig out the dogma that seeps through the bone marrow of our blood, which is another way of saying I'm pissed, which is another way of saying violence between communities of color didn't begin with this. Didn't begin when Peter Liang, a Chinese American NYPD cop, shot a Kai Gurley, a 28 year old black American. Or when Bill Makari, a Filipina American, was walking near Times Square and was attacked by Brandon Elliott. And the security guards watching it happen from inside the lobby chose to close the door. And isn't it that, that another form of violence? The way we wedge our bodies in our own diaphragms, curl our shoulders in, look down. So we don't have to call the blood our own or our fault because we didn't breathe the same air that person did. Like we didn't carry a weapon in our mouths, tuck it in and strategically whistle it out through a spit of tweets. Convince communities to call their neighbors other, call them contagious, call country and continent a disease. Paint a red X across each other's backbones and ask ourselves how we got there. America, my immunocompromised country, the way you cough out bloodstained anatomy pointing to each mouth, body, and look. Look, see where it all leads. How you are both the soil in my Lola's garden. The soil she sows seeds in, but also the dirt resting six feet under that buries black and brown bodies. How you hold them in your roots. The ones that wound themselves through the branches of arms and legs until they decompose and become the foundation for what you grow. When I say our histories are intertwined, what I mean is that we breathe the same air. The kind country claiming other country left. The kind white supremacy left. But also the kind that circulated during the Philippine-American War of 1899, when black American soldiers chose to fight alongside Filipinos. The kind that of roots colonialism through collective activism, the kind that called out for ethnic studies during the Third World Liberation Strikes in 1965, how the work isn't finished yet, how we go to streets when one of us falls, how we hold ourselves gently, but also hold ourselves accountable, and do the same for those around us. Which is another way of saying <coughs> that this country needs to call itself out and call itself in. Because country means breathing in unison, or at least being willing to share the same breath. We breathe the same air, placing our hand to chest and belly in the space we cleave to keep each other away, a space that typed in otherness instead of our names. So instead of that, we, we pay, pay homage to the names of black and Asian American activists and organizers. To Audrey Lorde, Grace Lee Fogg, Grand Beal, Gwen Patton, Yuri Kochiyama, Meredith Ross, Pat Sumi, and Miriam Shane Yoon Louie. We pay homage to our teachers and bus drivers and healthcare workers like my mom, to how we keep each other safe. To the Isam Bagsak, we clap to our singular exhale in. To the United Farm Workers Union of Mexican and Filipino immigrants. Passing on the singular breath, still breathing, still alive, still. Lola waking up in the morning, still. Her body aching, tired, still. Our bodies aching and tired. But what is work without movement? And not the willingness to catch and receive and pass on this breath. Not us breathing ourselves in like instinct.
that it's just kind of like everywhere I go kind of follows me. But in like a positive way, like this is who you are. Uh, I feel very connected to my culture. I love being black. I've always been proud of who I am and been proud to be a black woman, um, regardless of the challenges or the obstacles that come with it. What do you want to say to the audience? I would say just respect black women because like I feel like people like always shit on like the black community, especially black women, but then non-black people um, want to like appropriate our stuff, use stuff that's part of our culture, use our slang, all that stuff. How do you want to feel in the future? Um, I Where do we go from here? Be able to live in perfect authenticity and my organic self without any influence from outside forces or systemic ideals. I came to a point in my life where I started thinking like someone who stereotypes people of color, but I just, I hope to be able to catch myself when I'm thinking like that and be like, you don't know anything about this person, why would you think like that? I'm just going to continue to push the needle forward so that people of color can one day be free.
something I'm supposed to know already, but I know nothing. Other than a couple things, Catholicism, Lady Pacquiao, Adobo, Pipe Soap, and karaoke. I'm ethnically Filipino, but culturally Tahitian, and my nationality is American. Out of my three sisters, I'm Morena, with my two older sisters are Mestiza. Along with being Morena, I have a flat nose bridge and the tip of it full of this. Many would say I have the typical Filipino nose. Now, we didn't frequently visit my Lola's house, but when we did, she always had something to say. When I was about nine years old, after a two week long vacation in Hawaii, we went to see her. Well, I'm naturally tan, inevitably I had tan even more. We all went into my Lola's bedroom and I walked up first to bless her. Whoa! Grave Nama, you are so dark, you need to stay out of the sun. My mother always told me to tan as much as I could, even as young as four years old. I'd always ask, why? And she'd say, because you will be a beautiful Tahitian dancer. Ori Tahiti is one of the traditional dances of Tahiti. The attire is one of the biggest parts of the dance, like the length of your pareo, or how your bra must consist of the same elements as your headdress. You usually braid your hair so it's big and wavy, and you tan naturally to complete the look. My mother loved the way I looked wearing brightly colored pareo. In white and yellow, I look sunny. Being tan made me feel so pretty. So I didn't understand why my Lola wanted me to be pale. My Lola, who was once a young boy and a girl herself, with the typical Filipino nose, was criticizing me, someone who resembled her in so many ways. Now that I'm older, I don't believe in capitalism or Christianity because of how its colonial background has heavily influenced the way I see myself and has given false narratives of how we, as Filipino, should discard what our ancestors have taught us. I wanted real Filipino culture, the kind untouched by colonialism. I didn't know it yet, but that's what my heart yearned for. Many people around me say they just know their culture, that their grandmother or their aunt taught them the way, or that their languages and practices shape what they know. I can relate to that for Tahitian culture, but not so much for Filipino culture. There was never a Filipino Disney princess for me to look up to growing up, so I'd say things like, I am Pocahontas and Mulan put together. But when Moana came out, it was different. When I finally got to the theater, I sat there with so much anticipation after months and months of waiting, finally, there was a princess like me, an independent princess who wore a broad top and skirt, whose hair was thick, long, and wavy with brown skin. She was everything I'd imagined for myself in a princess. The scene that always sticks with me is when Grandma Tala is dancing with the manta rays and teaching Moana how to dance. It reminds me of when I dance with my sisters and of my dance family teaching me what I know. In another scene, Tala sings to Moana, people who love will change you. Things you have learned will guide you, and nothing on earth can silence that quiet voice still inside of you. And when that voice starts to whisper, Moana, you've come so far. Moana, listen. Do you know who you are? Although I relate so much to Moana, I don't know who I am. I learn more and more about Tahitian culture every day, but 
but I am scrambling to find Filipino culture. Pre-colonial Filipino ideologies consist of worshiping multiple gods, following on binary people, and women being the leaders of the family. Now, I see it also includes following Christianity, ostracizing against those who don't follow the gender binary, and toxic masculinity upheld by the fathers of the households. Grandparents telling me to marry men with lots of money so I wouldn't have to lift a finger and so I could bear children, also with hopes I'd marry a white man. I still have a lot to mend about my disconnect from Filipino culture. On my back, a tatao connects to how my village in the Ori Tahiti community has guided me through my dance journey and coming of age. The tattoo artists included traditional tatao and a Tahitian tatao to represent my Filipino ancestors in some form. It reminds me to do what I can to learn and revive the culture they created. Moana had to learn the way of a voyager in order to maintain the legacy of her ancestors. She was responsible for keeping their spirits alive. We all have a little voice inside that we should have inherited from our ancestors. Yamatala reassures Moana that her existence is guided by those past and present. Moana is told she is who she is by what she loves. And she responds by singing. I've delivered us to where we are. I have journeyed farther. I am everything I've learned and more still. It calls me, and the call isn't out there at all. It's inside me. It's like the tide, always falling and rising. I will carry you here in my heart. Moana's ancestors weren't literally whispering in her ear for every step, but rather sending traditions, love, and spirit through the family that surrounded her. I want to be the delivery person of my cultures. Not knowing where you lie with your culture fills your world with desperation or leaves a big boy. You end up venturing out beyond the culture you were born into, or you are left to your own devices, making guesses about who you are with no one to guide you. You wait and wait for the little voice inside to tell you who you are. But there's nothing. I've never done the Filipino candle dances or kanikling. My titas and titos always said I was so FOB for wanting to do them and that it was to Filipino. They suggested that I instead try hip hop or ballet, but that wasn't my cup of tea either. It was too American. On top of that, there were never any places in the Bay Area I could go to learn Filipino dance, so my mom put me and my sisters into Tahitian dance. I've worn pareo and rei skirts. I used the E and I sang and humena with the entirety of my being since I was four years old. I have been gifted the name Eva Eva for my bright party-like personality. But I've been told that I'm a culture vulture and to learn about your own culture. But this, this is my culture. The blood may not run through my veins, but it lives within my mana. The first time I heard the voice was when I was dancing. The drums pounded and pounded. I hit my hips to each beat, and it felt as if someone were guiding me through step by step. One, two, three, four, pa'arapu. One, Two, three, four, ta'iri tamau. Up until that moment, I could struggle to dance with fluidity and grace, but as the voice got louder, everything became clearer. I danced with my mind and body as one from the roots of my hair to the tips of my toes. Every time I step out onto the stage, I journey deeper into my soul. 
maybe one day I'll be the Nikling as I pa Arapu or teaching bye bye to the Filipino youth who are just like me. My ancestral voices may never but clear or exist as one, but one thing I know right now is that the voice inside me is a little Filipino woman dancing with someone's ancestors in the heat. I'm going to get over you, because I don't care. I don't care about you in the slightest. Like your perfect blonde hair that you insist is brown, or your eyelashes that you paint with the slightest bit of mascara, because God knows we can't do makeup for shit, or the way you move your hands when you get all excited about something, and you act the whole story out when you don't even need to. You don't even realize you're doing it, but then I point it out and we start laughing in your bed, wherever we are. Or when you put on that starry silver necklace, and I felt closer and farther to you than I ever have. And I feel you're the only person who loves me, or even likes me at all. I don't know how you put up with all my weird shit and inability to be a normal fucking person, but you do. And you deserve so much more. But I don't care, in the slightest. When we're sitting in the car and the red light paints your face and the white light shines in your eyes, I look at you and I smile even though you're not. When that happens, I'm smiling because I love you. When I tell you your mascara looks pretty, it's because I love you. When I tease you about your blonde hair, it's because I love you. And when I sit across from you in the library and I tell you all the reasons you annoy me and why I hate you more than anything in the world, it's because I love you. Can't you see that's why I do it? That's why I do everything, like give you gum or hold your hand when we're watching TV together. It's all because I love you. And you say you don't want to talk about it. What even is it? I don't know what we are anymore or what we even means. If I have to hate this we that is so platonic and stagnant, just to spend time with you, I will. We both know there's something more, but if I have to pretend there isn't, I will. Because I love you.
should have known the night before. The little dots that mean someone is typing stayed on the screen for what felt like forever. And only a few misspelled words appeared. I should have known that morning when she texted me. Just my name. Which scared me. I should have known when she found me in the hallway before fifth period, stumbling with sagging eyes and slurred sentences. I should have known from the year of sweaty hands in the dark, stairwell tears and shaky smiles. But I didn't. I didn't know as I leaned <laughs> the exhausted body on mine on the floor of the big stall and held her as she drifted in and out of consciousness. I didn't know as she pleaded with me not to get help. Or as I gave her one last hug and told her I was sorry. I didn't know until the bathroom was filled with beeping walkie talkies and unfamiliar adults pulling her away from me until there were sirens wailing through midday streets, paramedics and police crowding around her. I didn't know until a man kneeled down and asked her if she had tried to kill herself. And she nodded. So, so slightly. When your friend almost dies, they give you a granola bar and send you back to class. Now I know that stitches sometimes look like smile lines, that the brightest masks can cover the bloodiest faces. Now I know that the tears that leak through might be mere drops from an ocean. The pain you see only pebbles at the base of a mountain. And I wish I could say that everything is better now, but the truth is that I still don't know what to say to a friend who hurts so much that they want to die. I can't dry up the ocean with scratchy school tissues. And I can't stop the rivers and rain running it deeper. I don't know how to bury the mountain. Or even how to see to the top through the clouds. I still don't know if I did the right thing or how to make it better. And I still don't know if we'll be okay. be square holes, there cannot be round pegs. 
say the contours of sine wave cityscapes and the imitating glass. They say other things too. You will never be androgynous enough. Say my voice and my body, mirrors send sound back too. And something must be wrong with the curvature of this two-dimensional me hanging on the wall because they're warped and crushed. All they are is sand and heat. You will always be too androgynous. Say their voices and bodies in the city, and I know all they are is sand and heat, so why can't I let them wash away? Another question to echo in eyes, mine and others. Why won't it wash away? There are two voices and two bodies in the city, hanging from signs and windows, that other form of sand and heat which you can see right through. One of them I'm supposed to always want, but never have. For the other, the act of not having is supposed to dissuade me from wanting. Could I have one? Could I have both? Could I want neither? No the voices of bodies say. They are ideals, limits to approach and perhaps converge upon, but never meet. We will never meet them. And so they can say, not enough, and too much, and place us in the uncanny valley of humanity. I don't want to be the person next to the bathroom they make me use. I make myself use. With his head flat as a pancake and severed from his body, short arms and legs that end in semicircles. Nor do I want to approach the other limit, with her body defined by the strange triangle around her waist that forces her arms out to the side and shrinks her legs. Their heads are the same grotesquely disconnected, and their limbs are the same, rounded and useless. They differ only in which one has those sticks and circles attached to a rectangle, and which one has a triangle. A rectangle is about as useful for reinforcing structures as a twig, and a triangle has way too few sides to be anything interesting. Why would I want either? Why would I want either? I'm supposed to have four sides with opposites parallel to each other and all at right angles and a diagonal length equal to the square root of the sum of the roots of my two sides as proved 4,000 years ago and by my doctors and by their voices and by my mirror and my own rectangle body. What is inside the rectangle remains immaterial so long as it remains with four sides. However, a rectangle is a box, but so is a triangle. Must they be my shapes? And 
suddenly I hear Ziara whisper to Cassidy how she bet she could run all the way to her house in two minutes flat as a brag and not as a means of brainstorming survival. Because we've only seen escape routes planned in Mission Impossible 17. Everyone <laughs> huddled around the table, mapping out each other's placements in a harrowing maze. Rhea calls out, Look, I can see my house from here! And we all watch the tip of her finger point, like a bullet recognizing where it wants to land. But all of us become stark still when our teacher says that most school shooters were teenagers. Said Baldi. Said Columbine. Said Stoneman Douglas. Said kids back then used to huddle under their desks during drills, but understand that the next shooter was doing the same. And we can't help but look around the room at ourselves, straining to imagine us ever hurting each other. The mass public saw these people as crazy, insane, even evil. But when people are isolated, detached, nothing feels real, and they can do anything. Class is silent until Ziara asks, Were the gun buybacks effective in taking weapons out of their hands? Yes, political actions were absolutely necessary to stop the violence. We voted out the filibuster. Oh, we voted out instant care. Right, corporations divested from the NRA. Yes, and we stopped the $28 million, the massive money given to politicians by gun lobbyists every year by the end of the 2020s. But it was beyond that. What else do you think we needed? Not police or armed security of schools, but mental health counselors, culture keepers, social workers. Communities not grounded in reaffirming hate and fear, but resilience and empathy. Treating no one as disposable, but building trust, safety, and belonging. And suddenly, the whole class is a chorus of voices. So loud, our teacher's pen becomes a magical wand. Jotting our ideas onto the whiteboard. And after, exhausted from all the words we grew together, she writes in big letters, Hope is a discipline. Because hope isn't something reactive, <coughs> but a practice. It doesn't value power over truth or lives. Hope holds a community gently, but also accountable. It holds politicians and corporations accountable. It tells us not to forget that history can repeat itself. It tells us to keep organizing beyond just the ballot box. It says, I know the world is bruised and bleeding. Grief so thick it can fill the lungs of an entire classroom. But hope lets us reimagine a future where we can breathe out. And when the class ends, the bell rings. And so we let that breath fall out of our mouths. Our bodies so light we lift ourselves into the sky and fly all the way home. Or to the movie theater. Or the grocery store down the street. Or the food court in the mall. Or the temple. Or the park. Or the parade. Or the protest. Or anywhere in our community we would gather.
But then again, I don't even know my own gender. My gender reveal party would be white balloons, and when you cut into the cake, it's just white frosting coating the layers of confusion. The party poppers would spray confetti in the shape of a question mark. <laughs> and yet still, somehow, people would bring dolls and dresses. I've tried to find my identity among the mountains of labels, but how could the wiki understand my gender better than I can? <laughs> I know these feelings aren't unique, and I know these thoughts have been thought a million times before, so... Why does it feel so lonely? If I step on a scale, all I'll see is fat, and if I look in the mirror, all I'll see are wide thighs and a girl trying too hard to be something she is clearly not. But I'm not a girl. I'm not a girl. All of a sudden, the mirror comes to life and tells me it's all for attention. As if I didn't already know that. The mirror likes to plant seeds in my mind that make me too afraid to go out. Like this one time on a Saturday afternoon, I just wanted to get some Starbucks, but my hair was really oily that day. So I didn't go. I like to play this game. Which voice will be the most powerful today? The one that tells me I'm ugly because the hair on my hand is showing? The one that tells me I'll never get in college because I got an 89 on a test? Or the one that puts a question mark after every statement, even though my mom told me I just need to be more confident? I know. It's silly to get caught up on little things, and I should just ignore them, but it's easier said than done. It feels like I am surrounded by an ever-present haze of fear that one day my friends are going to wake up and realize that I'm fat. My body keeps me in the house, and my gender keeps me in the closet, so where am I supposed to go? And I mean, gripping that armrest. 
we all know there's only one type of grip that could be. The next thing I know, Charlie's hand is moving under the covers, Emily is breathing heavy, and I mean heavy. We all know there's only one kind of breathing that could be. So my phone is pushed off the armrest by Ben, who is clutching onto that armrest for dear life, trying to be as silent as he possibly can while busting a load. And I'm over here with my friend who looks like she's been through a breakup with how much she's crying. The bed is shaking, the sheets are moving, Emily can barely form a sentence with how heavy she's breathing, Charlie has a smug little look on his face, I'm still as a rock because I'm high and confused as fuck, trying to silently alert my friend as to what is happening, who's completely oblivious and still going on about fucking pasta. <laughs> Do you see what I'm seeing? Wait. The same exact thing just happened to me. I'm literally scarred for life. Why is everyone so horny all the time? <laughs> like, get a fucking room! <laughs> It started as a typical Tuesday, from what I recollect. Waiting to pick up the body from sleep. Because isn't this how you wake? Climbing out of bed, making hot chocolate to the sound of my sister's TV show. Every morning I woke up, spent 40 minutes trying to get dressed, and another 10 trying to bust a nut to get out the door on time. I'm going to get over you, because I don't care. I don't care about you in the slightest. That movie I watched. Damn it! What movie did I watch last night? Beyond the passion fruit vines, I wait. We go through our days, shoulders brushing, watching the bumblebees, until one time. I remember it exactly. It wasn't even when it happened that I felt powerless. It was the night after, sitting in a park with friends, chicken nuggets, and stolen nail polish. But I should have known the night before, or that morning, when she texted me. There are some feelings that change you indefinitely. Feelings that leave such an imprint on you that you should definitely remember them. Sometimes it gets hard to look into mirrors and see something that isn't you. Sometimes it gets hard to look into a world and see something that isn't for you. They can always say, not enough, and too much. Not knowing where you lie with your cultures fills your world with desperation or leaves a big void. Feeling empty and cold when you go home and wanting to put tiny band-aids over your big wounds. People don't really know what I am or how to act around me. I've never been white enough for white people or brown enough for brown people. Like throughout my whole life, I've been white passing, so I haven't been as confined to the stereotypes about being Latino. I know these thoughts have been thought a million times before, so why does it feel so lonely? You wait and wait for that little voice inside to tell you who you are, but there's nothing. You sit in a park and sob, brace yourself for the two block walk through the torrential downpour, curling your shoulders in, you wedge your body inside your own diaphragm. Look down. And I wish I could say that everything is better now, but the truth is that I still don't know if I did the right thing. I still don't know what it means to be woman. What the gender of my true love would be. Who I am, what true Filipino culture is. If it's normal to have your period for 80 days straight. How to just be a normal fucking person. To the tossing and turning of my restlessness, I ask myself, why? We know the world is bruised and bleeding. We don't know all of the answers. But we're here to remind you, remind ourselves to breathe and to look around yourself. We're all human beings full of forgetfulness, of shame, of calm, of loneliness, of horniness, of love, empathy, and solidarity. Uncurl your shoulders, look up. 
When we process and heal together, the journey becomes easier. It may feel stiff at first, yes, but it, it will, will become smoother. smoother. Slowly patching together what's been broken piece by piece. If it were possible, I would have gotten a refund, but I guess these things just don't come with receipts. <laughs> One thing I know right now is that the voice inside me is a little Filipino woman dancing with someone's ancestors in Tahiti. When I cut my hair in the bathroom sink or put on my favorite ball chain necklace, I'm affirming what I feel and who I am. Living in an identity of my own making, I build my own nest where I'm not limited to the materials you offer. I dance with my mind and body as one. From the roots of my hair to the tips of my toes, everyone wants to feel stable and to feel seen and recognized by their community. We all have a little voice inside of us that we should have inherited from our ancestors. I want us to dance together, to eat together, to speak together. I reach out a so-called olive branch, spreading like the entangled roots of our friendship. Hope holds a community gently, but also accountable, because hope isn't something reactive, but a practice. Our bodies remain aching and tired, but what is work without movement? Can't you see that's why I do it? That's why I do everything. It's all because I love you. There's no one else I'd rather do this with than you. I want you to see me. Look me in the eye. Look yourself in the eye. We deserve to feel loved, to express our most authentic selves anywhere in our community. Hope lets us reimagine this future where we can breathe out. Sit back, put our feet up, and enjoy. This belongs to me. Belongs to you. Belongs to us. really special out of this. Um, logistics, uh, if you want to meet and like hang out with the actors, yeah, please just make sure that you fully exit the little theater. And then, um, yeah, if you want to return your programs, we'll have a basket for that too. Yes. yes. 